in the previous lecture, lecture 12, we define invariance. So if you remember, we look at a very simple problem, and it's a timer that counts from 0 to 1, and then it gets reset to a half. Okay. So as you see, the trajectories not only remain in this interval a half to 1, but also converge. We're going to talk about convergence later today. You have a question? Okay. Um, so from this point, actually, the jump map takes you back to the half, and we check that. And every time that you start from the half, you flow within this interval. So we said that this set was <coughs> invariant. Okay. Now, invariant could be backward invariant or forward invariant. We're interested only in forward invariants. Okay. So this is what we would like to generalize now. So the idea is that, in general, so given a set, let's call it k, and in that example, the set k was the interval between a half and one, close, and a complete CPS. given by x dot equal f of x, x in c, x plus equal g of x, x in d. And again, remember, this could be inclusions. <coughs> we can think about invariance of this set in a pictorial way. So let me denote by this my set C. Again, this could be very specific in your application. I will denote this as my set D, where the events occur. And now I'm going to pick a set K. Okay. Now, as you probably realize as you learn more about executions of these systems, if you pick an initial condition to a system with this C and D that is out here, there is nothing you can do from that point. Actually, that point would not define an execution because it's not part of where you can flow or where you can jump. So when you're looking at invariance, you can, without lots of generality, think about sets case that are contained in these regions, red and blue. So you can think of Something like this. Again, we are talking about a pictorial uh, view of this problem. So what would you say that if this set was invariant should happen at points that you are only on the event set of the jump set? So when I speak this point, they say the boundary of K and it's inside D only. <clears throat> if it was invariant, what should G do relative to K? Map of value back into K. Okay, so any point here that is only allowed to evolve due to jumps should be mapped back to a point in K, if K is invariant. Okay. It doesn't matter if it is back to D or back to C or the two points, two sets, a point in the two sets. You just need to go back, okay? So from this sample point that I have here, let's call it x, I will need to have that g of x is, let's say, somewhere here. Or I could think about the case where this is an inclusion, okay? And now this point belongs 
to g of x, or you could have this other point belong to g of x. We cannot allow a point that does like this. Okay? For k to be invariant. So that's a check, and again, we discuss it for a particular example on Tuesday. Now, take another situation where you are here, just close. Okay? So if I'm at the point here on the very left of this set K that is also in C, I cannot allow solutions that flow outside. So who defines the direction of motion of the solution? So think about the timer. Okay, this C would be the entire closed interval, and the D would be just a point. So we are at the very back at the one half point. Okay, remember one half to one? We are away from the, the one half. We said that that one half to one set was invariant. Why was that the case from the point one half? So the velocity of the state, which is defined by f, in this case was one. So you were always being pushed into the set. Okay. If I want to look at F in general, and if I pick a point like this one here, I will better have a direction of motion of my state, in other words, the vector velocity pointing inward. In the ideal case, or you could have a trajectory that stays in the set by going along the boundary, in which case the vector will be Tangent. Okay? So you could have this situation. But you definitely don't want to have a situation like this, where flow takes you outside. Okay? So what would be the conditions, if you will, with this basic description that F and C and G and D should satisfy. Well, the first one is already written there, and I can write it generally, which will be the values that G takes me from points in D that are also in K belong to K. Okay? Infinitesimally, for every point, this says, in other words, for every point X in D intersected with K, which is this whole area, sorry, this whole area, I forgot my eraser, but I'll clean that up. For every X in that area, we have the G X is an element of k in the single value case or in the set value case is contained. Okay? So what is this amounting for us? Well, it's an evaluation of a function which could be set valued on a set that gives you a set. That set needs to be contained in another set. Okay, you can do this brute force. You code a function g. You code the set uh, g. Sorry, you code the set d and k. You intersect it, and then you check all the points. You make a grid, and then you check. Okay? But you can do it analytically. 
Make sense? Yeah? Okay. So this is for the jumps. I noticed that I did an analysis here only where D, um, where X belong to D, but also holds when you are inside, right? Otherwise you can have jumps out. For the flows, what we would like to have is that for every X in C intersected with K, we have f of x points in a way that we can flow within say in c intersected with k and remember what i said if flow is possible. And this is key. In other words, if I'm at a point where the flow set and the set K boundaries coincide, then flow is not possible even because of C. So I could come here and refine this set a little bit and say, wait a second, I'm going to do this. So this will be my C now. So at these points, I don't care if the vector field is pushing me in this direction. It's OK. Because if it pushes in that direction, it tries to flow. That's not allowed because C itself does not permit flow. Okay. So this is almost like a mouthful for the flow part. We'll check it in examples. If we were to write this analytically and precisely, we will need to define some objects, something that is called a tangent cone. And you can see that in the notes. However, we will not need to compute those here. But you can see and learn more about those there. <coughs> Questions? No? Yes? Okay. Some comments and I will write them down. Notice that this condition should be checked for sure at every point in D in a sector. Where events occur and where I want to stay in variant, I need to make sure I jump back to where I want to go. For this other one, I need to go out here and think a little bit about it because I say C intersected with K, what is that? Is this K intersected with this new C is giving me this thing, right? Okay. Do I need to worry about points that are inside here? Because if I am inside here, I'm away from jumps, I'm only inside C, and if I were to flow, flows will allow me to do flow for a little bit, and I can do whatever I want. As long as the flow doesn't take me to the boundary, I don't need to worry. I need to worry about only the boundary points. Okay? So in the interval, one half to one, Inside the one half to one, it's okay. It can do whatever it wants. I just want to stay in that set. In other words, flows don't jump like jumps. Right? So the bottom line is that this actually you just want to check only at the boundary points because it's where you can escape. In other words, in this case, you might want to just check it along all these boundaries here. And you don't want to check it at these boundaries points of C only, because C does not allow flowing out there. Okay. okay. So some notes.
the mathematical condition for the flows requires defining the tangent cone to a set C um, the typed <coughs> lecture notes. Now for points in the so-called interior of C intersected with K, <coughs> we do not need to worry about the direction of F. If you're familiar with interior, if you have a set very simple, if I have a set 0 to 1 interval on the line has interior equal to 0 to 1 open. Okay, so are all the points that you can put a neighborhood around and still be in the set? Okay, make sense? Okay, and then the last thing <coughs> is that typically checking the boundary points C intersected with K suffices to show that K is invariant. I also should say that in addition to the tangent cone, we also need some property of F, in particular continuity when it's single value. But we're going to omit some of those technicalities in this course. Questions? So let's work out this example that we did already, the thermostat example. <clears throat> so we did example 12 in the previous lecture, so let's complete it now. So the idea of that example was, in simple words, that we have the complete CPS in the thermostat example is given as so we have a state X that was the temperature and also the Boolean discrete state of the machine, the continuous dynamics of the temperature with a unitary constant for the decay is minus T and I guess I'm taking zero temperature for outside for simplicity and then Q was trivially evolving according to Q dot equal to zero. And then at the events, we were resetting this according to these maps. So this is when T is larger or equal than T min and Q is equal to zero or when t is less or equal than t max and q equal to 1 and then the events 
were actually when t was below or equal doesn't really matter the equality I'll make a comment soon or when t is larger or equal than t max so we are going too far and q is equal to 1 and here I'm assuming that t delta is larger than t max then t mean is larger than 0 that the rate for decay was 1 and the temperature outside I believe it was tr is equal to 0 okay so in this case we have t is less than or equal to t max so it's both inclusive in jump Okay, so you want to talk about whether equality or large or equal or less or equal goes, or strict, sorry. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's address that. Um, as we argued in the definition, there is no priority. So I'll pick a solution, I'll pick a function, which is on a hybrid time domain and given by a hybrid arc, and I need to satisfy this dynamics. Okay, keep in mind that I have t delta larger than t max. Okay, so you look at this event condition and it overlaps with this flow condition at q equal to zero, t equal to t min, and at q equal to one, t equal to t max. Okay? What I'm going to argue, and we're going to make it clear in a few minutes, is that putting this equality here or here does not change the solutions that we have because when you hit those boundaries, you cannot flow. So, I'd like you to work this out, but let me start it. I'm, again, we're going to address this um, equality case. So, let's, we're going to figure out, our question is, what is a invariant for this system? What is an invariant for the system? Okay. So we can draw the following. We can say that I have two, vario two values of Q, minus one, sorry, zero and one. Okay. So zero means no heater, one means heater. Okay. And then I have these two thresholds. So maybe I should just say here also that T max <coughs> is strictly larger than T min. Okay? <clears throat> so I have these two thresholds. Let's say that this is one and this is the other. T min, T max. Okay? <clears throat> so when Q is equal to zero, when q is equal to zero, t larger or equal than t mean is allowed. So let's plot here temperature. So that means that when I'm at this point, t can be anywhere above t mean, correct? For flows. t larger than t mean. Okay, so I'm going to draw this as an interval here. So what is this? This is our C for Q equal to zero, correct? Now I can do the same for one. When one is what Q is assigned, T less than T max is what we can allow. Okay, so now it's this inner one, correct? So this is C for Q equal to one. Where is the jump set? Where are the events? 
Well, for q equal to zero is t less or equal than the mean. So it's the whole thing. And for q equal one is this other length, right? This is d for q equal to one. So now we can think about what flows and jumps to, right? So if I pick a point, let's say right here, think about this general picture that we had earlier, right? This picture, in which direction is the F pointing us to? Well, first we need to identify F, correct? Okay, so F of X is equal to what? The solution negative t plus t minus It's not the solution, but it's the right hand side of the derivative. The solution is the function of time that satisfies this thing, right? So this, the f is the right-hand side of that guy, so it's this whole thing, correct? So it's, it's a function of x, which is minus t plus t delta q, zero. Okay? So can we plot this here for q equals zero? Right? In this line, Basically, what is this vector? That's what we're trying to plot. X has two variables, t and q. Can we plot this vector on this space? We should be able, right? Again, you have, forget about this, this system. You have a vector field f of x equal to x1, x2. What is that? It's the vector with component x1, x2. Now we have a generic um, picture in mind, come back to this picture, well, give me a value of x, let's say capital T equal to T max, or a little bit higher, and give me a value of q, zero. What is this vector? Well, it has a length in the q direction that is zero, right? And it has a length in the t direction that is minus t, the value that you pick is the direction, um, is the length of the vector, right? So I can plot it not to scale, perhaps, but this will be my f of x at this point. Correct? So this will be essentially, this vector here will be minus t, zero. Somehow reverse because I'm changing the order of the, of the variables, so these things should be change because I plot the different for simplicity. Okay. When is that vector field zero or that direction zero? When t is equal to zero. Right? So if this is zero, here we have f of x zero. But otherwise anywhere here f of x is a vector pointing down with positive magnitude. Yeah, and you can calculate it right here, right? What it will be? Minus t min. Correct? And that number is positive. So that would be the length of that vector. Now you can do the same here and you can realize that now the vector field because I have t delta and I have q equal to 1 and t delta is larger than t max and this point is below than t max, so minus t max plus t delta is positive, therefore the vector field pushes up. <coughs> okay, so we have this picture right here, and we can actually now realize that if we were to plot the vector field here, which direction should it go? Up or down? 
up because let's say t delta is somewhere here so this guy will go up and if I were to plot it here we already say it's always pointing down unless you're at zero the vector field will be pushing down okay so we have almost like two timer dynamics but they revert directions depending on Q which give us this behavior okay so let's stick to that thought what happens with the jump map well where can I jump well I pick an element in D an element in D and I jump U to G what happens to the variables well from here you can read that G at X is equal to what T 1 minus Q so what happens if I now pick a point here which will be T with Q equals 0 what happens after the reset I mean the jump event set correct so T will re remain in the same value so if this was negative something it will go back to negative something so you're gonna have a map on this direction but Q is gonna reverse from 0 1 minus 0 gives you 1 so this will be G of that point X and you can imagine that the same will happen here actually why don't we do it right here at this very point you're gonna go back to this direction so now is the question I like to think about and work on yourself for a few minutes is what is the invariant set for this system what is a set for this system such that if you start you stay for all time okay and try to think about the smallest one right because I can say well everything yeah everything is invariant I mean the entire C union D is invariant because we already know that you stay in it but what about the smallest invariant set make sense 